doing films for Netflix. Sure. Because I don't think I've ever talked to, well, Roma, but I didn't talk to you. Um, the director for that, it was the actress, the, the actress and uh, the producer for that. But uh, because it's amazing that someone like Martin Scorsese and mm. someone like you are doing films mm. for that outlet. And what is the advantage of that besides people will watch it from their homes? And Look, we're, you know, you're a storyteller and you're looking for someone to farm to a very high level these ideas. and. Uh, uh, you end up in front of people, you tell them your story and they say, we'll make it. And it's so uncomplicated and so seductive. And you have to work hard to come up with a rationale not to work with someone yeah. like Netflix. Um, their decision-making process is so quick, literally. I, I, I can tell you the story of this particular film. Um, over two days I'd gone around all the studios, so this was the Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, Sony, Columbia, TriStar, so forth. On Friday, last meeting, um, last pitch session was with Netflix. Take the elevator up. I walk into a room. Three very youthful young women, very smart. They glance at me, and then their heads go back down to their pads, rather like this. And they go, great, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So I start talking, tell them a story. They're taking an enormous number of notes. And then uh, at the end of my pitch, they say, we'll do it. And I, say, and I say, um, <laughs> wow, okay, um, how much uh, money would you provide? And they said, oh, whatever it costs. Yeah. Well, it's funny because every time I look on Facebook, I know a lot of the publicists through the years and they're all joining up and going to Netflix. Yeah. And studios are nervous, though, like, for the people. Yeah, like, they, they have a different uh, calculation to make yeah. when you tell them a story. But what you want is an audience, right? Well, I remember taking the elevator down, and Dan and I, Dan was the producer, and it was, um, the question in our minds was, do we forego the normal cinematic um, experience of six or eight months, you know, in the theatres, um, uh, and go with the more streaming model, um, uh, you know, potentially 150 plus million mm -hmm. homes, and... Um, by the time the elevator got reached the ground floor, we decided we'd, we're going with Netflix. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's exciting, but well, I mean, I still like to go to the theater the yeah. experience, but as far as getting your work out there, it's great to have both. Because, it's great to have both. Yeah. And now that they're, they're changing their model to allow these theatrical mm. windows for some of the films. Uh, that they think are awards contenders. Yeah. So, what is your secret to doing these films? I mean, Theory of Everything, and uh, Darkest Hour, and... Bohemian. Bohemian. And what is the magic? Because we've seen... One thing I think is happening is biopics aren't necessarily biopics. Like, I like the Darkest Hour approach in, mm. in which you're not getting Churchill being born and blah, 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 blah. You're, it's in his greatest moment and his darkest moment, mm. you know, mm. and, but you still learn who he is mm. and you see him in action. Mm. Whereas with um, Bohemian Rhapsody, I mean, his big moment at the end is Live Aid, so we know we're gonna go there, but mm. it's a little more traditional, although the music makes it, mm. The, those moments really elevated to the next level to see what they did right. to get that sound. And then the theory of everything, I mean, it was just that performance, it lived and died by Eddie Redmayne and because we believed him from the mm. moment and you had to show us when he was healthy and then what happened. Correct. And so that was, a, again, a little more traditional, but mm. still it was mm. the right, version but mm. but how do you th when you want to put someone's life on the screen I mean is it just you you wait to see who who they are and then that influences your approach to it um, yes this a, that's a very interesting complex question um, and I have only the partial answer to that because a lot of it's instinctive mm -hmm. but essentially um, when I make the biggest and first decision about a project is 
why do I take it on? And, and I'm drawn to projects that combine the intimate and the epic um, in a perfect world. Then you have to decide what period of the life you're going to look at. Is it cradle to grave or is it just a, you know, like a, a very um, interesting, telling moment in that life? And for some time I've, I've been an advocate for um, that the evolution of the biopic was towards these, these short stories, yes. these, these slice of mm -hmm. life, these distillations where the essence of someone's revealed. Um, but half the time I ignore my own rules and, um, and the reason I do it is because you have to look into the life and say what's the theme of the story mm -hmm. and you let the theme decide where, what's your start and end point mm -hmm. and so if the theme is the, take Stephen Hawking, um, the physics of love and, and the love of physics, mm -hmm. I had to tell that love story. So I couldn't just take two weeks in the life of this couple. I mm -hmm. had to show what that endured in the, in the kind of cosmos of the relationship. Right. So it dictated the terms. So I go, yeah, okay, I'm going to make an exception to my cardinal rule and I'm going to do this. And I'm doing more exceptions to the cardinal rule that I've realized that there's something faulty in the cardinal rule. Um, the idea that traditional is bad, yeah. and that taking a multi multi-year version of a biopic is lesser or less risk-taking is a misreading of of what my job is right. you have to serve the theme and you choose the number of years that will best reveal that theme well this the two popes story is more like the darkest hour mm -hmm. because it's a crisis they're both correct yeah. dealing with yeah and but you still learn a whole lot about these men, and you, you do show, yeah, you know, yep. them, you know, yeah, in, in different ages too. I, I like the black and white part. You, that was like the perfect actor to be. Jonathan it was terrific, Price. wasn't it? Yeah, the nose and the yeah. ears—they were yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to ask? Uh, yeah. Well, um, specifically about the two popes, I'm curious: was there any personal link that you had to? Uh, Catholicism that really made you want to explore the subject? Well, I was raised in an intensely Catholic family. Um, uh, seven kids, more coitus than interrupters. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, we had priests in the home. Um, the church was the sort of spiritual, intellectual, emotional center of the community. Um, so uh, many of the themes in the movie were kind of in the blood. I lost interest in the Catholicism, however, after about the age of 16, um, and remained more or less disinterested in being a practicing Catholic um, for most of my life. Uh, it, I think the reason is that Catholicism felt like an airless room that for so long there was nothing changing when the times called for change. Mm -hmm. And with Francis and the adv advance of Francis, there was a, a kind of a window was thrown open on, on that airless room, and there was suddenly a fresh breeze, and it re uh, sort of rejuvenated my interest in the Catholic Church, especially because it seems now a kind of uh, a uh, uh, a uh, what's the word shell. No, it, it seems reflective of the of the wider issues that society is uh, facing. More broader than just the church yeah. issues. Yeah, yeah. I, and, it's certainly an analog is, is the yeah. word I was looking for. It's analog. An, it's yeah. an analog to what's happening in, in society at large, um, with the, the the battle between the progressive position and the cons and conservative position, and, and that and how those two camps are moving ever further apart, um, with more and more acrimony, you know, streaming between the two. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting, therefore, to have a debate between a progressive and a conservative and see if a middle ground cannot be found. And um, so I, I hope that it, it has resonance outside anyone interested in matters Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think one of the things that is really interesting about it and has caught so many people off guard about the movie is mm -hmm. how genuinely funny it is. Um, well, I'm delighted yeah. about that. Yeah, I mean, it is just, it really is just a really funny movie. I think it could be, it should be classified as comedy. Uh, <laughs> because I really think that that's what, that, that that's what, that's what makes, the, that's what where the true humanity shows for both. Well, I would not resist that. I never yeah. thought comedy is a lesser form. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm wondering is, how did you determine 
to uh, how did you determine the balance between humor and especially like the real life seriousness, like the politics of the church and um, the uh, you know the, the the sexual abuse scandals, the controversies over there, uh, non evolving positions about things. How did you determine that balance? Well, Francis is known to love a joke, so that to do justice to him, uh, there had to be some hum attempt attempts at humor, and. Um, Benedict is kind of famously a stranger to humor, and and I thought there's even there's something funny about that. So you have well, when he says that was a joke, yes. yeah, <laughs> everybody yeah. laughs. Everybody laughs, yeah. and so you know, one telling a joke and it falling flat because this guy just can't comprehend what what was at all funny and what what had just been said. So there was, that had the potential for funny, but I, honestly. Humor is an aspect. It's not an overriding aspect. I wouldn't classify any of my work really as comedies, but I try to make them lifelike. And my take on, on reality is that there's got to be some humor in there if, it's, if it pretends, portends to be um, lifelike. Anytime two people get together, there's usually an attempt at humor because it's how we do the basic transaction. I have to build trust with you. How do I, how do I make you trust me? I'll tell you a joke. When we're laughing, we're together. It burns, you know, it breaks down the walls yeah. between people. Yeah. So I, I, there's always going to be um, some humour, and I and I want it to be realistic humour, and I want it to come from character um, rather than gratuitous stuff just thrown in. There's no banana peels in this. Well, I, I bet it just thrills you to hear those two actors speak their dialogue. Oh, uh, I, you know, I'm so blessed with that, and uh, yeah, when I went into Netflix, I actually. Kept with, with Dan Lin, the producer, we brought in two photographs of two actors, Jonathan Price and Anthony Hopkins, and just lay them on the table while I told them the story. And at the end, they, Netflix said, um, so do you have those two actors? And I would go, well, not, not exactly, <laughs> not yet, not at this moment, but uh, we're hopeful. And it never happens, but they both signed up to the project. Uh, I'm also interested, how did... Um Fernando Morales come to uh, sign on to direct this because I um, I think of Fernando Morales and I think very fast paced movies like City of God and The Constant Gardener although mm. some may not classify this fast paced but mm. it has a lot of uh, intensity and action to mm. it. Uh, how did he come to uh, be the director for this movie? Well, the first iteration of this was as a stage play, so I wrote it as a stage play. I went to Los Angeles. My agent said, look, there's a producer um, who's interested in doing something on Francis. Maybe your dialogue between Benedict and Francis, you could, you could work together with this producer. So this guy's name was Dan Lin. Dan, unbeknownst to me, had been in conversation with Fernando about doing a Pope Francis movie. No. But they didn't know how to crack or what their angle would be on the Pope Francis movie. So um, uh, Dan got hold of my stage play and sent it to Fernando. And, and they obviously had a little minor epiphany that this could be the way to tell that story through this debate between the two men. So was your play produced? Or? It was, yeah. 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 But did it play here? No, it's just at its premiere. I'm hoping to bring it into the West End. And oh, cool. Yeah, and, then maybe it and, then <laughs> and then you could just live off the proceeds of your Pope details. <laughs> uh, yeah, my papal proceeds. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm also curious, uh, was there any trepidation uh, when you first had the idea of actually exploring the subject matter, considering how when something as, you know, even just the idea is presented to some people of touching a subject like this, mm. regardless of how it is actually presented, mm. uh, that, that you know that it can cause you know a firestorm of things, and mm. especially with something like the Catholic Church that mm. can have you know very organized arms about that kind of thing. Was there any trepidation about exploring that? Um, sort of, but I don't let that bother me. I mean, if I'd worried about it, I wouldn't have done the last two or three films because it's highly presumptuous what I do. I'm putting words in the mouths of famous, iconic figure, figures who people have some ownership of. You know, pub the public feel they know these people. And so I'm coming in from left field and doing these sort of definitive portraits of these people. But, that, you know, I'm getting away with it. So, you know, I'm trying to stay bold and... Um, and be fearless, which you have to be, yeah, but to do justice to it and remain in the service of the truth. That sounds ob ob 
obviously a little pretentious, but essentially that's the remit, to be in the service of the truth, to do your research, to get it right, and to paint this painting, which it is, it's, it's an impression of someone, it's not a photograph, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that even that subject, when they come around the other side of the easel and looks at it, recognises themselves. And I've had that, I mean, with Stephen Hawking, he recognised himself in the movie. Even though 90% of the words that came out of his mouth I'd invented, and 50% of the actions that didn't exactly happen in that way, he gave me a two-word verdict on his, his voice computer, broadly true. And um, I'll take that any day. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But see, when, I mean, I'm a lapsed Catholic too, but you know, kind of, you, you want, you're still curious about what they're doing with the church because it affects so many billions of 1. people. 1.4 billion, yeah. yeah. And so I didn't think I would like Pope Benedict and you made me like him, so. Well, I had the same more. journey. Listen, yeah. I had the same journey. I didn't like them when I started writing, but you have to love your characters equally. Uh, yeah. If it's to be a, a, a fair debate, you have to mm -hmm. arm and equip both sides. Um, you know, with the same firepower. Um, otherwise, it's you know the contest is unfair, mm -hmm. and it had to be. You know, it, I mean, these are all rules. This goes way back to Plato and the dialogues. You know, yeah. it has to be. Um, it has to be statement and rebuttal, and rebuttal and statement and. Mm -hmm. Um, they have to have both the same sort of veracity on both sides. So in doing that, I, I, I actually um, developed a real empathy and sympathy for, for, for Benedict's position. The well, he chose position. his predecessor, you know, or not predecessor, his successor. Right. So he knew what the church needed and he didn't feel... Just one slight correction. He didn't choose, he doesn't have the power to choose his successor. Oh, That's done yeah. by conquest. Right. But he had to have known, this is my feeling, that his resignation would, would usher in a period of uh, change because the man who came second at his conclave that it had elected him was a reformer. So mm -hmm. there was every likelihood that, that him stepping down would bring in change. Mm -hmm. So I saw somewhere that you might do a John Lennon. Definitely happening. Definitely you pick happening. It after? We haven't got an actor yet, no, but we're hoping to shoot next year, and it's the wonderful director, Jean-Marc Vallée. Oh, and, yeah. And it's Universal Studios, and yeah. um, we're, we're, we're good to go. So that's a very exciting one. I, I, I'd love to revive John Lennon's voice and, and have it sort of speak to the conversation we're having. I mean, there's been documentaries, and there's been Beatles, not just him, but focus on him. It's him and Yoko, yeah. and then uh, Yoko has never had her due either. Um, she's yeah. been un very unfairly uh, represented and maligned her, her entire career. Yeah. And when I showed her the outline for the movie, she came back, if you like, Stephen Hawking with a very short reply, and she said, fair. And, very, and she added, nobody, very few people have been fair to me in my life. Yeah, well... She was blamed for the breakup. I don't think she was. She was blamed for everything. She was blamed for being Japanese. Right. You know, it, was, it was horrible. Yeah. She was very, very Well, mistreated. the thing is, he, she made him happy. So, she did. Yeah. She did. And she yeah, it was it. a change in him. He and softened she, so much. But because, she helped yeah. politicize him, too. He was, yeah. he was not politi polit polit right. politically engaged at all, you know, right. before she met Yoko. And Yoko brought out a, um, the artist in him. Mm -hmm. Well, God bless whoever has to be this legend, and uh, they're lucky to There'll have There'll be someone out there. There'll be someone out yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny that now, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, like Rockman. I, I love musicals, hmm. and I love when you play with musicals, yeah. you know, and I loved how the music was done yeah. in, in Bohemian Rhapsody because hmm. you it was just so fun. I mean, th those were my favorite moments when they were together, creating the sound. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm actually. I leave here and I go to to Broadway. We're in a workshop on a Neil Diamond musical. Oh which my is gosh! Breathtakingly exciting for me. Um, yeah. My mother loved Neil Diamond. I grew up with it, with his music on repeat play. <laughs> Whenever my mum was blue, she played Neil Diamond. So I, I know every lyric of Neil's song. And I'm sure we'll see the Neil Diamond story too on the big 
big or streaming site. So. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, keep making them because they're, you certainly have a knack for bringing alive these figures that are larger in life and making us see them in a way that uh, is very appealing. Thank and, you. Well, I can true. promise is I'll do my best. Okay. Well, you better. No. <laughs> okay. Well, that's understood. <laughs>